Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello. For the next half hour, we're going to be talking about water and the climate crisis with my guest, Dario Soto Abrio. He is the Executive Secretary and CEO of Global Water Partnership based in Stockholm, Sweden. He's the former global CEO at Fairtrade International. He's served as a corporate lawyer and was formerly the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Trust for the American Americas, the NGO affiliate of the Organization of American States. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much, Nancy. It's such a pleasure to be here today. You obviously are concerned about the impact of climate change on water resources. This is a problem globally, worldwide. Are we going to be able to take important mitigation measures to deal with the crisis? We are still on time to make important mitigation measures. And at the same time, we we're acknowledging that with the crisis we're facing right now, we have to combine mitigation with adaptation because the crisis and the climate change is a reality is happening right now. So beyond mitigation, we also need to talk about adaptation. We know that there are over 2 billion people living in countries that are under water stress and that 3.6 billion people face inadequate access to water at least once a month per year. And by 2050, this is expected to rise to more than 5 billion. That's half the population that will be on the planet. Yes, indeed. And that's more aggravated if we consider that the temperature is increasing. So the reports estimate that it's going to be increased by 2 degrees centigrade. And the most positive reports estimate that it will be 1.5 degrees increase. So that means that we're going to have more water evaporating from the natural causes where we have it right now. And that will be mean that we'll have more droughts and more flooding at the same time because the climate is very, getting very unstable with more water in the atmosphere. It's going to be worse than what we have right now. It's difficult sometimes for people to understand this water issue because in certain places there are floods, more typhoons, more hurricanes, more water disasters by having too much rain, too much water. Mm -hmm. And then in other parts of the world, there's so little water that people are encountering drought. Has the weather changed so much that it is bad in one place with too much water and bad in another place with too little water because it's not being shared equally? That's a one way to see it. I would also say that it's also the unpredictability of these changes. As the weather becomes more extreme, as you said, we're going to have more droughts and more floods. But the other thing is that we don't know when these are happening. The weather patterns are changing, so the rain seasons are taking more and more time. They're coming not at where they used to come, and also in terms of droughts they were in the past, now it is more extensive. It's happening more and more. The climate change, what it has done is making the climate patterns more unpredictable, and the rain rainy and the drought seasons to extend for more time, more months than what that they were before. The statistics are shocking. Since 2000, flood-related disasters have increased by 134%, and the number and duration of droughts has also increased by 29%. Those are large figures, and that's very recent within the last two decades. Is this something that is different than what has happened over the centuries? Well, they were we're seeing actually that the occurrence of this large uh, incidence of droughts and flooding in the last 20 years is much more prevalent than in the last, as you said, the last two centuries. So we're seeing they are more bigger, but they're happening more frequent than in the past. The changes are visible, and it's in the repetition that it happened in the past. It will happen, you know, the big incidents will happen probably once every three years, once every 50 years, but now they're happening once a year, once every other year. So that unpredictability and that the intensity of the event uh, is much more higher right now. And again, that's because of the different patterns that climate change are bringing. 
which are totally unpredictable. We know that most flood-related deaths and economic losses have been recorded in Asia, while most of the problems with drought has occurred in Africa. You yourself come from Colombia, South America. We rarely hear about what's going on there, and yet, of course, it has the Amazon and the largest rainforest in the world. What is happening in these different parts of the world? Why is it different? Well, I would say it's not necessarily different. Is that because of the weather patterns there are more stable in the past. You know where the monsoon would come. You know where the rains would come uh, in Africa and also in South America. Now what's happening is that they're coming at different times. So, for example, the monsoons are expanding. So it's pretty much all the year is raining right now in Asia. In countries where you had droughts, but it's seasonal, like in Chile or Argentina, now they could report that they haven't droughts for more than 10 years. So the intensity, again, of these occurrences is, is more, much more prevalent, much more impactful than in the past. Add to that that the countries are not prepared to deal with it. You know, they're prepared to have a more predictable patterns for agriculture and for economic growth. They know when the crops are going to bloom and grow, and but now that's not happening anymore because there's less water happening are coming in, in the rainy season, more water coming off season. Uh, so it's very difficult to predict also for economic and human activities. And that's what's happening really there. The other thing that is important to mention is you, you're talking about Asia, South America, and Africa. And you know, people from the global north, people who are in the US, in Canada, in Europe, in the past, they used to think, well, this is a matter of the uh, global south, of least developing countries. But as you're seeing in California, and as we see seeing here in Europe, in Germany, and in Belgium, and other countries, now this is happening also here. So as you might remember the flow that happened in middle Europe in middle uh, of June of this year in middle Europe which was something that has never been seen before and only in economic damages it actually total seven billion uh, US dollars and you might also remember the losses of the drought in California in 2014 2016 which were at close to five billion US dollars as you imagine you know, that now this is hitting closer to home for people who thought this was more an issue of Africa and the south it's not something that is going to hit so I think that's great in putting this topic more and more in the agenda at the global level. I know, based here in Los Angeles, that we have not had too much rain throughout the year. We have very little rain, and yet it's happening more often, and it's happening mm -hmm. in a stronger way. In fact, yesterday when it rained, I was driving the freeway, and one whole lane was just like a river. The roads were not constructed for the stronger water deluge, and the houses and the infrastructure is not designed for this kind of situation. And we're in the developed world, so what kind of of changes need to occur both for North America and Europe as well as for the Southern Hemisphere? First of all, there should be decisive political action, meaning that policymakers, the people in power, should really, really show that they have the strength to deal with this. Because when we talk about climate change, as you know, there are many interests from many industries and many economic sectors, and you have the pressure from households, so you have the pressure from the agricultural sectors, you also have the pressure from industry. So one is political will. The other one, of course, is the availability of funding or, or investments, because to for us to be able to mitigate, to face the challenge, as you said, you know, the roads are, and the roads and the infrastructure is not ready for this. So it will require a lot of investment and a, a lot of funding from both in the case of the Global South National, but also multinational, uh, multinational bodies like the UN, the World Bank, uh, the Inter-American uh, Development Bank for the Americas, the Asian Development Bank for F uh, Asia, etc. There should be also political will, so then the other one is financial investment. And the third one is measures that the country who need to start implementing, for example, can we talk about innovation in water filtration uh, systems? Can we talk about policies that protect the wetlands? Can we talk about, uh, with the agricultural sector, about irrigation efficiency? Can we talk also about water storage, protecting and rebuilding the dams and the places where, where the water is, is collected? So there's many actions that governments and companies and even households could take to adapt and mitigate uh, climate change. In fact, your organization maintains that the current rate of progress needs to quadruple in order to yes. reach the global targets by 2030. What are 
are those targets? Well, we're talking about the sustainable development goals, targets like elimination of hunger, uh, poverty, more uh, gender inclusion, more employment for youth. We have the, also the water target, which is a uh, sustainable development goal number six. So all these targets, believe it or not, are tied to climate and are tied to water. If, for example, let's take about target that relates to end of hunger, there's no enough water to uh, irrigate the crops, then there's no crops. And then if there's no crops, there's no food for humans. And as you know, and so the water available right now is being reduced, whereas our population globally is increasing. So if we don't tackle the issue of climate, and this is just one example, not the issue of uh, hunger as a, as a global target that we have by 2030, elimination of hunger. If we don't address the issue of climate and coupled to it, the issue of water scarcity, we're not going to meet those targets. And the same applies for employment, the same applies for something that you might say well, has no relationship with water and climate, gender inclusion. It does, because what we're seeing, for example, is that in the issue of water management, where in countries in the global south, women are not represented in the discussions, and the policy discussions. Yet, they are the ones more impacted by the water scarcity at the household level. They are the ones who have to bear the burden of bringing water to their house to do the cleaning in many cases. So you see that without water and without addressing the issue of climate, we're also not going to address uh, gender inequalities in the world. So that's the target that we are aiming to achieve by 2030. And when we say we, are meaning the entire world. This is a commitment that all the countries make to meet the sustainable development goals. In fact, governments are meeting at international conferences, symposia. The COP26 is meeting to discuss water infrastructure and other climate change issues. What do you hope will be accomplished? I hope that countries take decisive action. What does that mean? Really first putting the financing that is needed for uh, investments in mitigation and adaptation. There's the Paris Agreement. There are many mechanisms that have been set there to finance uh, mitigation and adaptation measures for the entire world, particularly the less developed countries, which need a little bit more of help. But it's not enough. It's not enough, and it's not only the funding, but access to these funds that are available. There's a lot of requirements for countries to access those. So can the government take decisive action in terms of making more funding available, but also the funding that exists already, making it easily available to those who need it? The other one is political will. As I mentioned, there's a lot of lip service when, you know, publicly people talk about climate change, but when it comes to push come to shovel them that there's no real action and countries also have to or, or respond to interest in their own economies from their own industries from their own interest groups so we want to see decisive action there's still time to act on climate change but at the pace we're doing it right now it's not going to be enough to revert the effect of climate change so we want to see that political will and committing to much more actions to mitigate and adapt to climate change we are going to talk more about what can be done to deal with the climate change issue with my guest Dario Soto Abril with the Global Water Partnership when we return in a moment. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310-559-9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org. Now, here's Nancy. I'm speaking with Dario Soto Abril. He is Executive Secretary and CEO of Global Water Partnership. Could you explain what your organization does and how you are working on trying to solve this massive problem of water, both too much and too little around the world? Yes, indeed. Thank you again, Nancy. The Global Water Partnership, which, by the way, is celebrating 25 years of work, what we focus on is in supporting and empowering different stakeholders from uh, different sectors, uh, civil society, women, youth, political actors, for all of them to come to the table and agree on the right way to manage the, the water resources. The only way for water to be managed, for us to be efficient on it, is that all sectors are represented in the table. What happened in the past, before the, the Global Water Partnership was created, is that only some industries, or only some voices will be heard when deciding about water management and what would the best use for water would be. Only will go, the government experts and technical people will come to the table. Now what we're doing is democratizing this, this conversation, making sure that all the voices are being 
heard, that actually the communities can come to the table and discuss with the policymakers. The businesses will have a place on the table, but so would community leaders, so would nonprofit organizations, so would civil society. And that, for us, is the core of the work, because what has happened in the past is that many of these decisions related to water and, and resources are made at the very top level without considering the realities on the ground. You have worked as a corporate lawyer, so you've worked with companies. You have been the former global CEO at Fair Trade International. You were former deputy executive director and chief operating officer of the Trust for the Americas, which is an NGO affiliate of the Organizations of American States. How do these other nonprofits and the corporate world work together in dealing with this issue of water management? Well, what we're seeing is that the issue of water management process all industries and all organizations. So, for example, when I was in fair trade, which I, I was dealing with farming rights and um, I'm putting products from the global south in the global north, the issue of water, for example, water irrigation and water availability was key. It's key to the farmers in the global south. To give you one example, as you know, the war and in the U.S. this is also happening. We all love coffee. And what we're projecting is the coffee consumption or demand for coffee will double by 2050. At the same time, the water available and the land available for growing coffee will reduce by half. And part of that is because of climate change. And part of that is because of the lack of water, because of the unpredictable patterns. So that's a connection that you immediately see. You know, water is not just an abstract topic. If we don't talk about water, if we don't take measures right now, in 2050, which, by the way, is around the corner, 20, 28 years from now, we're not going to have coffee for everybody. The other example that you see is in, in related to human rights. And I'm going to give you a little story from my own country, Colombia. One of the things that happened with COVID related to water is that when the government decided to open again the schools, they realized that many public schools, the students could not go back to school. Why? Because there was no access to water in the schools. So what happened? The private school students could go back to the schools because there was water available there. They have uh, water and sanitation. The public school students, they cannot. So the poor students will be left behind. Why related to water? Because if there was no water to wash their hands in the middle of the COVID crisis, then people could not go to school. So that's one element that, that you will see tangible how water cuts through all of the topics. You make a good point that the issues of education, health, women's rights, gender equity are all tied together with environmental resources and what kind of environmental resources because I know that the orphanage I'm trying to help build in Kenya, the girls were walking two miles to the river for water until we were able to build a well. And in Burkina Faso, the girls were walking six miles to the river for water, and therefore they couldn't go to school and get an education. So it does all tie together, and of course we know about waterborne diseases and how important it is to keep the water clean. Could you explain terms like water-related hazards and water efficiency that were used in the 2021 State of Climate Services Water Report by the World Meteorological Organization, with which your organization, Global Water Partners, collaborated. Yeah, in terms of water efficiency, the simple explanation is that there are ways in which we can use the water that are more effective in terms of conservation and also saving it for future uh, events. It was reported that over 75 countries reported water efficiency levels below average, including 10 with extremely low levels. So does that mean that they're just short of water? How does the term water efficiency and water shortage work together? Water efficiency is about how efficient we could save and conserve water. So they are reporting low levels of water efficiency because with the droughts and with uh, more water evaporation, there's less water being conserved, and that touches on the issue of, of uh, water storage. You know, we're seeing that the fresh water available that is being conserved or, or storage is reduced, and governments are not doing enough to create ways to have additional avenues to conserve water. But also we're having less water presently available in this traditional storage means. Could you describe what a water-related hazard is? Because the report indicated that water-related hazards has increased in frequency for the past 20 years. Yeah, we're talking about what you were mentioning in your experience with the highway in, in California. You know, water-related hazards are more floatings that happen, for example, in Europe, are destroying infrastructure, taking lives, and are also coming up with a, a 
higher price tag. International organizations are urging for cooperative water management. How does that work when water is managed and controlled by local cities and regional states and provinces and even nations? Water isn't always shared. Here in the southwest of the United States, the Colorado River used to go all the way to the Gulf of Mexico into Mexico, and it's so overused by agriculture in cities that Mexico doesn't get their fair share. Yeah, so we are talking uh, there about two topics that are related. One is the integrated water resource management, which is how do you involve the entire community, all the actors of the industries, the farming sector, and also the households. Now, there's an additional ingredient in your example, which is what do we do when we have uh, cases of transboundary, rivers that cross different countries or water sources that relate to different countries, in your example, Mexico and the U.S. In those cases, in addition to having all the actors involved, so in this case, for us, will be a conversation and involving uh, uh, collaboration between Mexico and the U.S. so that the downstream and upstream use of the water favors everybody uh, equally or at least in a more reasonable way. We have been talking about too much water in some places, too little water in other places, but another factor that's so critical is how clean is that water? I have seen pictures of sacred rivers in India so polluted that people are going in where the chemicals are foaming around them. We know that there are still waterborne diseases that one can catch by swimming in rivers in Africa. We know that rivers here in the United States have gone on fire because of pollution. Is the quality of water being dealt with while they're talking about the quantity of water? I think it's part of the same mix, Nancy, because we're talking about water conservation, but also the availability of water. And we're talking about availability of water, it's about availability of fresh water. And of course, it's not only about the impact of uh, droughts and climate climate change and more rains, but also is the impact about, of human activity. You mentioned some of the cases where you have industries in the river throwing chemicals there. So part of what we do in the Global Water Partnership with our idea of integrated water resource management is precisely talk also, bring the industries, bring the farmers as well, and the communities that are impacted by pollution and water to have conversations about how can this be not only prevented, by, but also solved. And one of the things that we're seeing more and more is that while there's increasing water pollution, there's also increasing innovation and new technologies, not at the large scale that we would like to see yet, but I'm hopeful that in a five to 10 years, we'll have a cross the board implementation with technologies that will allow us to filtrate and, and clean the water are more efficient. We certainly have a need for urgent action to improve cooperative water management, embrace integrated water and climate policies, and scale up investments. Is there any example of who is doing it right, either company, organization, government? We have a good example right now happening with the uh, Global Water Partnership in Africa. We have the African investment facility that we're creating, and we're seeing a very good response in terms of countries investing in in terms of uh, putting resources for climate solutions and also not only countries but also banks, development banks are joining. And we're also seeing more and more companies that are putting into what they call in some cases water acceleration and also impact investment when they are financing small innovators, small and medium enterprises who are coming with specific solutions for very local problems. To me, one of the challenges is more how do you make these local good experiences or good practices to become more global? How do you scale them up? One of the things that we see from the Global Water Partnership is there are many, many organizations trying to address the issue of climate, trying to address the issue of uh, water, and they are doing it quite well and yet they're not talking to each other. So one of the lessons that we, and the agenda items that we're trying to pull forward is how can we bring to the table these other water organizations, these other climate organizations, to tell them do not work in isolation. Let's work together. Let's scale up all these solutions that you're coming, that you're seeing in Africa, that you're seeing in different countries. Because the funding sometimes is there, and what we need is to connect these efforts. We've been talking about global, international cooperation, work with 
non-governmental organizations and government agencies, but people always want to know what can they do. We know that the rising global temperatures and precipitation patterns are leading to more frequent droughts. That's particularly the case here in Southern California. It's likely to get worse in the future, and there's advocacy to cut our water usage, to change our vegetation in our cities like Los Angeles to native plantings. Is that going to make a significant difference? I think all of us could contribute to this. And I think that the first part of it, even before going to the interventions, is by getting involved. If you're being impacted in somehow by uh, water and climate, you know, the first thing is, particularly in the U.S., write to your elected officials. Bring your voice at the community level. Be heard by companies. Be heard by the community organizers. Be, be heard by the local government. So I think that's, again, participation, so political participation at the national and local level. The other one is you know, activities that you can do at home. If you are a farmer, you can try different irrigation systems, more efficient irrigation systems. You can try protection of better use of the water that you are using for growing your crops. If you are just at home and you can try to do conservation, simple as washing the dishes, but those kind of things add. And, you know, if we have um, five billion people who are doing small things, but they all add. And that's my message. We all have the power to contribute to uh, mitigate. When we talk about the current water situation where we have droughts, where we have too much water with flooding, hurricanes, mm-hmm. typhoons, etc., we're usually getting on the news reports of how this impacts human beings and cities. But how does the water issue affect ecosystems, the wilderness, the wild areas, the wildlife? Because we know that species are becoming extinct every single day. Who is speaking up for all these other plants and animals? That's a great question. And I think that the reaction has always been first, the human sector reaction. And as you said, we are not paying enough attention of the impact on the plants and also the animals. We're seeing it with the droughts in Africa and in Latin America. Millions and millions of cattle dying because of that. You know? and, and that also will impact our food chain. But we're also seeing more species becoming extinct because of that. We have a lot of good conversations with the conservation and with the animal welfare entities, and they're transmitting to us how concerned they are about, about the impact of droughts and flooding because they're really destroying the ecosystems. One of the challenges that we face is that we're too focused on the human and on the economic impact of climate and we're not seeing this collateral damage that we're seeing with the animals We certainly need to look at the interconnectedness because human survival depends on their survival as well, doesn't it? Indeed. Environmentalists were aware that climate was changing decades ago, but it seems as though the international community and governmental agencies and even businesses have just recognized this climate change problem in the last few years. What happened that finally got the world aware to a situation that could really destroy us if we don't make changes. When these issues were raised in the 70s and in the 80s, people felt that the impact would take long, long to materialize and that maybe also as human beings rely on hopeful feelings and hopeful thoughts that maybe a magic technology will come and we will have to avoid it. And some other people say we're already adults, so by the time this happens, I'm already going to be dead. So that could be part of it, uh, human nature. The other one is economic interest. At the end of the day, our countries and our economies are moved by the private sector and the majority of our countries. And they have a great political saying in setting the policies. And I would say that those times we didn't have integrated uh, approach to managing resources. So the civil society, the community community activists, the NGOs, the layperson would not feel that they have any say in the way we could set policies on climate and water. And I think right now what has changed is that the change is here and people know now there's not a way to deny it or escape from it. And that's what is creating a sense of urgency to act. Now, what is concerning is we might be already too late. And I think more and more countries are talking about adaptation and, of course, mitigation is part of the equation. There are so many issues related to water and everybody needs water, the wildlife needs water, the ecosystems need water. Mm -hmm. We certainly must treasure it as a valuable resource, much more so than we have in the past. I'd like to thank you so very much for sharing with us what you are doing and what the problem is and what some of the solutions are. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much, Nancy, and it was lovely to talk to you and uh, on behalf of the Global Water Partnership. 
please uh, keep the issue of water in the agenda. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have been speaking with Dario Soto Abril, who is Executive Secretary and CEO of Global Water Partnership. I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310-559-9160. Environmental Directions with your host, Nancy Perlman, is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.